Wow, what a journey we've been on. We have an author unlike any other, telling his story unlike any other. It all started back in the Garden of Eden when God spoke it all into existence and said it was good, including Adam and Eve, our federal head. But they messed it all up when they chose to sin. God promised to fix it through the offspring of the woman, the serpent crusher. And we have been looking for him ever since. We followed him through Abraham and through Isaac and through Jacob and through Judah, through Moses and through David, through the prophets. But our story went quiet. At the end of the Old Testament, God goes silent for 400 years, waiting for what Paul will call the fullness of time. That's where our story picks up next. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. After 400 years of silence, you can get used to the quiet. And a voice that you used to recognize, that you could pick up so quickly, after 400 years of nothing, it can get pretty easy to miss. From Malachi in the Old Testament to Matthew in the New Testament, God has gone silent for 400 years. But when he starts speaking, and he does, not only does the author continue to tell us the story, he actually steps into our story as the main character and the hero. I mean, as far as stories go, it doesn't get any better than this. Think about it. God, who is unlike us, he is completely separate. He's the creator and sustainer of life. He can speak things into existence. He wraps himself up in human flesh and enters our world as, as a baby. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. What leads up to this grand entrance, this royal arrival of the King of Kings? Well, nothing you would expect if you haven't read the story before. Like we've said, God has gone silent for 400 years, but he begins to speak using angels, as he often did, to come and speak to humans. The problem is, a lot of the people wouldn't believe the angels because after 400 years, if somebody were to walk up to you and say, yeah, God talked to me and he hadn't for 400 years, you probably wouldn't believe them either. One of the first people God speaks to is this woman named Elizabeth, and she's an older lady, and God says, you're going to have a son. Then God shows up through an angel to Elizabeth's cousin, Mary. Mary is a teenage virgin girl. She is betrothed, that means engaged, to a guy named Joseph. Joseph happens to be from the town of Bethlehem, from the family of David, from the tribe of Judah. Well, that's interesting. Mary and Joseph are going to be married. They live in a strict religious society. An angel comes to Mary and says, Blessed are you among all women, for out of you is going to come the Messiah. You are pregnant from a ghost that's holy. And I do this to tell you, if you put the humanity back in, this is insane. Because now Mary has to go to her parents and to her fiancé and say, Hey, great news. I'm going to have a baby, but I didn't do anything wrong. God told me I'm the most blessed woman of all time. Isn't that fantastic? Just put the humanity back in. Imagine that you come to youth 
and one of the teenage girls comes to you and is like, hey, great news. God showed up to me in a dream last night and he told me that I'm going to have a baby from the Holy Ghost. I didn't have sex. I didn't sin. Everything's fine. I'm just really blessed. Question, would you believe her? Answer, no, because that's not how babies are made. We know this. And if God hadn't spoken for 400 years and then suddenly your teenage fiance is like, hey, great news, you're going to be a dad, but you're not, but you are, and it's totally cool, you would have some questions. And so Joseph decides he's going to divorce her. The other option, are you familiar with this thing in the Middle East called honor killings? Yeah. Mary, by doing this, by being pregnant as an unmarried woman, she has brought shame on herself, on her family, on Joseph, on really the whole community. So an honor killing is completely a possibility here. And I bring that up because, remember, we've been tracing the close calls as the serpent tries to eliminate the line of the serpent crusher. Because if he can eliminate the line, then he doesn't even have to deal with the serpent crusher. So here you've got a teenage girl who's pregnant, and the angel told her she's pregnant with the Savior, the serpent crusher. And Joseph divorces her. Then an angel comes to Joseph and says, Mary is actually pregnant with the ghost that's holy. You can marry her. And so... He says, okay, wedding's back on. And his friends, wait, what? Really? You're going to let her get away with that? Fast forward. Caesar, the emperor in Rome, he decides he wants to make sure he's getting all the taxes he's supposed to. So he calls for a census, which means all men, not women, all men need to go back to their town of origin and sign in. Well, Joseph needs to go down to Bethlehem because he's from Bethlehem of the family of David of the tribe of Judah. Mary doesn't need to go anywhere. Mary and Joseph both go to Bethlehem. Why is she with him? Cannot prove this, but this is my theory. He's nervous that if he leaves her behind, she may not still be alive when he gets back. So they have to go to Bethlehem. Mary is nine months pregnant. She is going across a desert on a donkey. That's insane. Today, we do not let women travel by flight if they are in their third trimester or seven, eight, or nine months pregnant. What is flight? Flight is sitting in a chair in the air. Like, you don't do anything. You just sit there. We don't let women fly in their third trimester. And here's Mary on a donkey in a desert in her ninth month of pregnancy. Then they get to the town. There's no room in the inn, so the innkeeper gives them a barn. We call it a stable because it sounds nicer in Christmas pageants. But it's a barn. And so now you have Mary and Joseph in a town that they're not really from anymore in a barn. And the worst thing that could happen, happens. Mary goes into labor and you've got a carpenter, Joseph, who needs to act as doctor, midwife, and deal with the umbilical cord. So he does. She's giving birth in a barn. We give birth in hospitals now because we think barns are not clean enough because they're not. This baby should have died from infection. Joseph wraps the baby in some, we call it swaddling clothes, it's just rags, and he sticks the baby in a manger. A manger is a nice word for feeding trough. I grew up on a farm. Animals are creatures of habit. Whatever's in the feeding trough is food. It is very possible, I cannot prove this, it's not in scripture, but I'm just using human logic, it's very possible that Joseph had to spend the night keeping the animals from eating baby Jesus, and it's slightly humorous, like, my eternal destiny could have been ruined because a cow ate the Messiah. It's just kind of fun to think about, but thankfully he didn't. And then Jesus, who's just trying to get some sleep, is woken up because God, who hasn't spoken for 400 years, sends a choir of angels to a bunch of shepherds and they come and to want to meet the baby too. A couple of years later, some wise men come from a foreign country. They tell Herod, the king of Israel, that they come to worship the king of Israel. He gets jealous, he figures out through the prophets, Micah specifically, that this baby would be in Bethlehem. So he sends the army down to Bethlehem to kill all the babies. Okay, again, we have a problem with this because number one, that's genocide. We don't like that. But number two, if this baby dies, I am going to die and go to hell. So this is very bad. Well, again, God, after 400 years of silence, he's still speaking. He comes to Joseph the night before, wakes him up in the middle of the night, says, get Mary, get the baby, get out. They're coming to kill him. Joseph grabs the baby and Mary and they flee to, of all places, Egypt. And Jesus spends the next few years there until he finds out that he can come home. Comes back. We have this little story about when he's about 12 years old. He is at the temple in Jerusalem and he has this fascinating conversation of question and answers with the scribes and the Pharisees. And they say, we've never seen a kid like this before. He has unbelievable wisdom and understanding. Then we have nothing. 
from the time he is 12-ish to the time he's 30. We have one verse in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. He grew up. Wisdom got smarter, stature got bigger, favor with God, spiritually and man, socially. Jesus grew up. And it drives me nuts that that's all we get because this is the king of kings. This is God. This is the only perfect human. And he had brothers and sisters and he went to school and all this. And we don't get anything of what that was like. I've always wondered what was it like to have you know, a perfect brother. I kind of think my parents have a favorite child. It's not me. We all think that. Um, I'm sure Mary and Joseph had a favorite child because Jesus never did anything wrong. But we don't get any word on that. Fast forward, he's 30 years old. Remember Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, who was also going to have a baby? Well, she did. They named him John. John grew up to be a prophet. He was preaching repentance, and he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. So they called him John the Baptist. He's out in the wilderness. When he's 30 years old, Jesus comes out to the wilderness to meet John. Okay, hold on. we got to do something here. 400 silent years, and then Jesus is born. And then when he's 30 years old, he goes out into the wilderness. So 430 years. We've seen that number before. Where, oh yeah, Genesis to Exodus, 350 years, where God seems to be silent, he seems to be missing. And then Moses is born, and he spends 40 years in the palace. So 390 years, and then 40 years in the wilderness, 430 years. And then Moses comes back and leads Israel out of captivity, under the blood of the Lamb, into unity and harmony with their God. Fast forward. Malachi, end of the Old Testament. 400 silent years, Jesus is born when he's 30 years old. 430 years. This, this seems important. Let's follow what happens next. 430 years, 430 years, and Jesus is walking out into the wilderness. As John sees Jesus coming towards him, he stops, directs everybody's attention towards him, points at him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 29. Okay, if I am there in the audience watching John baptize, my Jewish mind just got blown. There's like four huge things here. Behold, that means look, process, grasp. This is important. The Lamb of God. Okay, that's Egypt stuff. That's Passover stuff. Who takes away sin. Wait a minute. Sacrifices don't take away sin. They just cover sin. That's why we have to keep sacrificing because we keep sinning and it just covers. So we sacrifice again. Who takes away sin of the world? Not just the Jews or the person sacrificing of the world. This is bigger. This is better. This is Jeremiah new covenant stuff. This is huge. So John points at Jesus. Just like Moses pointed at the sacrificial lamb 430 years after coming into Egypt as the way out of slavery. John points to Jesus and calls him the Lamb of God. Then John baptizes Jesus. He puts him under the water, and as he comes back out, we have this crazy moment. We have a Trinity moment. God the Father, his voice comes from heaven, and he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Son comes out of the water, and God the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Crazy. If I'm standing there watching, I'm going, something big just happened. Well, immediately, Jesus is taken by the Spirit out into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days, and then he is going to be tempted, tempted by Satan himself. If he gives into this temptation, he cannot be our savior. If he withstands, we still stand a chance. Because so far, he's been ticking all the boxes. He needed to be at least four things to be our serpent crusher. Number one, he needed to be of Jewish descent. And Matthew 1.17 tells us that he was. Number two, he needed to be 100% human. Being born of a virgin, being born of a woman, made him 100% human. He got tired. He got hungry. If he fell, it hurt. He was 100% human. Number three, he needed to have no sin. Well, so far, because he doesn't have the human father, there's no sin. Sin passes when a man and a woman come together. There's only been three people who have been born without sin. Adam and Eve, no earthly father, and Jesus, no earthly father. Adam and Eve messed it up. We know that. And then number four, he has to fulfill these messianic prophecies. That's coming. But as he goes out into the wilderness, this whole no sin thing, that's going to be challenged by the serpent himself. That's where our story goes next. Mm -hmm.